myself that I will read uh, from my fallback paper, but um, today I feel I, I do not trust my industry. Um, okay, um, how raw is raw data? Uh, I would like to to get a, a more general view on that first. Uh, with a question, what is punk? A question that some of us might be interested in has been analyzed recently by Matt Daniels on Polygraph Co. I guess many of you have come across this post and wondered, as I have, on how much value in defining a musical genre can derive from the Spotify community. Matt Daniels looked at playlists of Spotify users that somehow could be brought into context with punk. He used subgenres like post-punk and metalcore. The idea, of course, was to get a good overview on what punk has to be considered in the Spotify era. The result was quite ambiguous. The Clash, okay, um, this can be considered punk, that seems, seems okay. Clock TVA, yes, um, normally one would consider this maybe more as industrial or EDM, um, but still it's post-punk and so let's accept that. Uh, here we come into a problem because this could uh, bring us into fierce discussions that have happened actually uh, on, on the topic if offspring is actually punk or not. But uh, there's a certain quantity of persons that would accept it, so yes, we accept it, but now we have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> the way Matt Daniels analyzes a big data source is first of all a valid approach. He defines the pools of data that he deems relevant and then runs some statistical analysis on which bands appear most in those playlists. He is even able to establish a timeline of musical development inside the punk genre. But still, the result is too ambiguous um, uh, to render any valid definition of punk. Daniels himself seems to accept this stating, more than any other genre, whether a band is punk is a debate in semantics. Punk has never had a clear definition. It's a moving target rooted in principles rather than sound. And in 2015, an emerging generation can move that target to whatever they want it to be, even a band who might look, sound different than anything that preceded it. In other words, the term becomes invalid as to its purpose of making a categorization of musical genre possible. This brings us to the question, what happens if data is used without thoroughly checking the parameters of its creation? And furthermore, would it have been more adequate to check for playlists named like fuck the system? Uh, on a purely technical level, data in databases in its various forms can best be understood by describing it in terms of the closed world and the open world assumption. The open world assumption for data storage means that a statement can be considered being true, um, even if on the basis of the available data sets it is not known to be true. In a closed world, on the contrary, a true statement is necessarily to be true. The idea of the closed system is that a system of this type has complete control over the information. Relational database systems like SQL follow the closed world assumption, whereas ontologies like the Cytox CRM that is well known in archaeology um, follow the open world assumption. If as a result of a relational query, an assertion can be determined as true, it necessarily has to be considered false. In the context of an ontology, the lack of an assertion concerning a specific element does, not, does only imply that the truth value concerning that element is unknown. Systems following the open world assumption are generally considered as knowledge bases, not at least because they allow for the integration of new data. Theoretically, relational databases do not qualify as knowledge bases, but in the context of research, relational databases are not always, nearly never, properly used following the closed world assumption and are actually used in the sense of a knowledge base. Let me explain this further. In the humanities, relational databases are built on top of data model that will allow for the storage of a certain diversity of information. Yet, those databases cannot be considered as containing the entire amount of information that their structure would allow them to include. While databases are generally implemented at the beginning of a project, data ingestion happens continuously. Queries at different points in time will result in different responses. The value assigned to the contained elements therefore follows more the open world than the closed world assumption. Database systems that are built on top of the relational model generally are developed in close connection to user application, often allowing, following the well-known object-oriented approach, which together with the relational database organizes and constrains the contained information and its validity. 
This is especially true for scientific databases like in archaeology, where a strong focus is set on the development of these front-end applications. To understand the knowledge stored in these hybrid systems, it is necessary to analyze both technological aspects, relational database and object-oriented application. As we will see, the difference of database systems and ontologies has strong implications on the possible use for the stored information. But what are the epistemological implications on the information that is supposed to be stored in the databases? In the last decades, research in the humanities has seen the emergence of a series of turns, which are understood as fundamental changes in scope and focus of the scientific community. For some of these turns, it has been argued that they involve the entirety of science and in consequence make it necessary to continuously reintegrate existing research programs into the respective reigning turn of the moment. The language the propagators of these terms make use of is similar to the rhetoric of scientific revolutions, a well-known concept described by Kuhn in 1962. As it is well known, Kuhn stated that existing scientific concepts and terminologies are transformed by the introduction of new paradigms that then substitute the scientific framework that had been in use until then. According to Kuhn, these paradigms render research before a revolution incommensurable to science after the revolution has occurred. In consequence, it is necessary for every scientist in the scientific community to overcome the traditional framework for remaining scientifically successful and to, for, uh, to allow for the validity of a scientific assertions to be reconfirmed. In the time around Kuhn's analysis, a branch of philosophy, the analytic philosophy, was gaining momentum. This type of philosophy had its origins in the earlier works of logical positivists like uh, Frege, Russell, Ayers or Moore, <clears throat> the Wiener Kreis uh, with the Neurath Okanab and Wittgenstein and others, of course. The main impact of this type of philosophy was the recognition of the fundamental dependency of all human knowledge on the modalities of expressing knowledge. As a consequence, the examination of the world and any attribution of truth to sentences about the world was not only related to some extent to a specific usage of language, but it was actually not even conceivable without the consideration of linguistics and acts of speech. In consequence to Kuhn, as for example Latour and Volgar have shown, scientific truth is to be generally considered as dependent on the social context of each singular researcher. While the historical approach on scientific knowledge puts the focus on the agents of research, critics like Hacking furthermore suggest that the social aspect of this dependency is itself only part of a deeper problem, having its roots in the way scientific knowledge is generally expressed. This again is a notion that points at the argumentation in analytic philosophy. What I just wanted to show with this little uh, scheme was, um, which is very general, um, the problem of having statements that tell us something about the world, whatever this may be, um, and these statements relate in, in research to concepts that, that are defined, determined, and then in an inter, um, interpersonal um, discourse um, create further research. Um, the, the only thing that is important at this point is that um, those instances and also research to a certain extent and also understanding what, what the social really entails uh, in this sense is not possible to understand or to grasp properly. Bachmann Medic has published a catalog of uh, these turns in humanistic research mentioned before. She sums up different turn movements which had been coming along in the last two decades. While Bachmann Medic understands the impact of each of these turns as far reaching, she mentions at least in the beginning of her book the suspicion that the turns in the humanities do merely share the rhetorics with what would be considered a more far reaching event, the linguistic turn. This linguistic turn, which is a term that originates from the title of a seminal book, uh, edited by Richard Rorty, is identified as the impact of analytic philosophy and the identification of a fundamental change in regards to the necessity for epistemological inquiry. Following Rorty, epistemology before and after the impact of analytical philosophy and the dependency on linguistics made it necessary to reconsider the value of epistemological inquiry as a whole. The primary consequence of the linguistic turn, according to Rorty, is nothing less than the total loss of the epistemological endeavor in philosophy. If the quest for mediating in between human and world is to be understood as no more than a question of language and variations of the same theme for the natural sciences, 
The humanities, in consequence, are left with nothing more than relativism centered around linguistic contexts. The subsequent turns, as described by Bachmann Medic, do not overcome the problems made tangible by the linguistic turn. They only vary the vocabulary of the most recent discourse in the humanities. And by doing so, they underline the basic problem the linguistic turn has made evident. Furthermore, the turns in the humanities in this sense do only qualify for a rhetoric emphasis on focus or topic, but not for a new epistemology. In consequence, a turn should be better understood as a varying point of interest or focus, which defines the topic of the turn, like the phenomenological or the material turn, or an implementation of a new set of methodology, which defines the name of a turn, like the digital turn. In contrast to these turns that have paradigmatic value only in a relativist domain, the, rel the relevant turn seems again to be identifiable only with the linguistic turn. While most philosophers seem to accept the relativist fate, merely underlining <coughs> the fall of epistemology, Rorty endeav Rorty's endeavor in the years after the linguistic turn was to determine a foundation for objectivity and attribu attribution of truth that was not only bound to a rhetorical construct. In this concept of an epistemological behaviorism, the foundation has to be seen within his understanding of solidarity, where the ultimate decision on whether a sentence has to be considered true or false is determined by its value for society. This framework grounds scientific inference on shared belief and therefore stands in contrast to a strong relativistic argumentation like uh, Latour, for example, in the humanities. The profound impact indicated by the linguistic term makes it necessary to look at how knowledge is stored when the real value of an information cannot be con established in a satisfactory man manner. <clears throat> As we have seen before, on the contrary to relational databases, ontologies are based on the open world assumption in the sense that information not explicitly contained in the datasets are not considered false but unknown. If at a certain point in time the information in the knowledge base guided by the open world assumption is queried and the result set is negative, this does not mean that the answer is false but that the information is not contained in the knowledge base. Ontologies, according to the maybe most commonly used definition of the matter, is a formal specification of a shared conceptualization. Following this definition by Gruber, a formally represented set of knowledge is based on a conceptualization which itself is defined as an abstract, simplified view of the world that is meant to be represented. <clears throat> This conceptualization is always at the base of any knowledge system, be it explicitly or implicitly. Ontology, therefore, is an explicit specification of a conceptualization. Ontologies are commonly used to determine the content of a database, making the included information transparent and even interoperable. Like this, the information stored in the database is meant to become comparable to the content in other databases because the semantic structure defining the content is transformed and rendered compatible. The understanding of data as conceptualized within ontology is actually much closer to the scientific understanding of information where an absolute false is quite impossible to be given. Interestingly, ontologies like the one Gruber describes based on a shared social aspect, hints already at the social aspect needed for grounding the way data needs to be stored and to be dealt with to be useful for research. Looking back again at research databases, one consequence of the broken closed World, uh, the broken closed world approach in research databases is that their data models cannot solely be considered as strict models, but they share aspects of ontologies. These specific data models need to be considered as ontologies whose semantics are implicit and not explicitly stated. Although this problem has been understood and the procedures for reverse engineering of relational databases, representation of semantic value of the database and its application, uh, architectures as well as their semi-automatic or manual mapping to one or more ontologies are widely applied, the necessity for a closer look on epistemological implications in that process is far from being discussed. <laughs> when a database is conceptualized, uh, developed and brought into usage, the implicit semantic value of these data structures is not made explicit. At the moment that ontologies are discussed to encompass the information stored in that database, the semantic implicit development is only understandable with a historical analysis of the database. As the information about the changing understanding of research is not modeled in the relational database, this information has to be retrieved when modeling the semantics. At this point, it might be, have been become clear that even if the modalities of existence 
are, necessar uh, are not necessarily of interest for the common user of a knowledge base, at the point of combining information from different knowledge bases, it will be necessary to discuss uh, whether the contained data has been generated with a similar shared understanding of existence in mind. In other words, if the modalities of existence are distinct from one knowledge base to the other, the content of these bases has to be considered epistemologically incompatible. Even if, the formalization, <coughs> even if the formalization of the data would allow for its combination. The common ground of relativistic uh, research projects, different ontological models, and implicit semantic value in knowledge bases is the existence of a flow of research in the momentum, yes, in the momentum of happening. This actually is an irreducible aspect of research that generally is not, or at least not consistently embedded into the structure of the knowledge base. Capturing the flow of research is closely related to the concept of applying the reflexive method in archaeology and um, research archives in context. The attempt to not only store objective data, but uh, include also the procedures that led to the generation of data and including even contradictory interpretations, allows for a more detailed view on the meaning of the stored knowledge. Ontology, as described by Kruber, already points into the direction of a dissolved epistemology, as indicated by Rorty. With an ontology understood as a shared conceptualization that has been commonly agreed on, the idea of embedding shared belief as the standard measure for assigning any truth value seems to lie at hand. This need for discussing the epistemic background of data is also visible in the procedures of how ontologies are defined. The seed of CRM, for example, is in a constant flow of development where new entities and properties are defined in a discourse called special interest group. The semantic value of those entities is defined as to the applicability, at least for all those persons present at the meetings. Still no definition is objective and the usage of entities and properties is further specified by examples, the scope notes. The definition of the ontology is a, is a social process in itself. What misses at this point is a technological solution to make the social aspect of knowledge tangible and allow for storing of this kind of information. <clears throat> Recently, as the question for the source of information becomes more and more important today for assuring the validity of a specific information, a semantic model has been proposed and developed that aids storing this kind of information. Provenance modeling is to be understood as an extension to existing ontologies to describe the origin of a specific information contained in the data. While provenance initially captured only the factual provenance of information that was easily deducible by examining from where a specific information came from, the implications of the examination for purposes of describing steps of inference became evident. The provenance of information in that respect is understandable as the steps in a thought process that led to the assertion that a specific information is to be considered the way it has been stored. Model inference in that sense is the description of how a specific information has been developed. The provenance of this information is the inference from a previous set of information. At this point, describing inference is compatible, uh, comparable to explaining in the sense of narrating the different steps it takes to combine a set of combination uh, information and make the inference on this information understandable. In other words, directed understanding. I, I hope. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm quite there. At the moment, uh, the Chatterhuig Research Project develops an information system, the Chatterhuig Living Archive, that integrates multiple project databases following the open link data paradigm. A first prototype already demonstrates how core data can be made available for analysis and reinterpretation following the project's reflexive methodology. The next step in our approach will process all knowledge available in, in the, the project's digital archives so that the aggregated research can be retraced and revisited by current and future scholars. The archive consists of formal textual and numeric records structured via the project database and individual specialist databases and spreadsheets, as well as free text documents, diaries, reports, chapters and edited books, entire published volumes, and even multimedia components. It also includes a comprehensive co a collection of spatial data stored in the geodatabase. The spatial data from the backbone for the exploratory web interface, which ties together other archival components and enables spatial, spatial temporal um, exploration. In the Living Archive, you already have one feature that uh, relates to the present discussion. 
the collections. It is possible to allocate different types of information and combine them for further research. New explanations of the data using those collections can then refer to the collection itself and make the inference tangible. Further usage of provenance modeling will be applied when combining unstructured and structured data, referencing in a way derived information like archive reports with the data stored in the database. This, of course, is a feature we have not yet implemented, but uh, we hope to do so um, soon. Modeling provenance makes scientific inference visible, accessible, and reproducible. The actual, actual data set can then not only be understood in its raw textual, numeric, imagery, or geospatial form, but contextualized within the workflow of research that led to its generation. In this way, the project-specific ways of knowledge generation can be retraced in people, institutions, entities, activities involved in their production can be identified, combining the technological, conceptual, and research strategic level. With the loss of the epistemological endeavor following royalty, modeling the inference of scientific data even seems as an epistemological necessity. Together with the analysis of implicit semantic value of data models and the integration of data models by the use of ontologies, provenance allows for drawing nearer to the actual, actually happening research process and the storing of information on how the process impacted the resulting knowledge. Thank you.